this week, as in life, the sad and the glad mingle. On Monday, the School of Education, where Edna taught, held a memorial in her name. On Tuesday, her brother Shimon and her husband Avishai were inducted into the Israeli Academy of Sciences. Today and yesterday, we celebrate 20 years uh, for the Center for Rationality. And today, uh, Danny Kahneman will give a lecture in her memory. It's a co complete coincidence that all of these events happened in one week, but uh, this has been a week suffused with memories of Edna, and you will hear more about Edna in the course of the morning. First, uh, Avishai Margalit, not only Edna's husband, but also one of the founding members of the Center for Rationality, will speak about Edna's contribution to the study of rationality. And after that, I will introduce the speaker, Danny Kahneman. Edna was many things to many people. She was a loving mother and a passionate grandmother. For us family, she was our working week and our Sabbath rest. Edna was a prime mover in an astonishing variety of institutions, formal and informal, academic, economic, as well as many basic institutions of our civil society human rights organizations, and other. I can go on, but I won't. I shall also shy away from elaborating the obvious that I miss her terribly. The acute sense of loss doesn't get better in time, and I don't want it to get better in time. There is a great, there is a great deal to say about Edna's role in the Center for Rationality, and her active contribution to its running. In the years, she was the director. Edna was an innate democratic aristocrat, not an aristocrat of status, class, or privileges, but an aristocrat of merit and strong sense of noblesse oblige, ease of manners, elegance, and supreme sense of competence and calm. Whatever she touched, gain a touch of class, and so I believe it was when she touched this unique center for the study of rationality. For Edna, rationality was not merely an academic subject, it was a personal strategy. She strongly believed in society of fair-minded and reasonable people. I remember her saying to me, Basically, I'm like a, the proverbial American who believes that all the people in the world can understand English if you only speak to them slowly enough and loudly enough. I believe that all people are deep down reasonable and you can tap in their reasonableness if you are willing to speak to them patiently and compassionately. She said this probably sounds pretty silly, but then she added, I cannot always get rid of my being a good girl of Jerusalem. Yet, when Danny Kahaneman and Amos Tversky cast their doubts on Edna's kind of optimistic picture of human rationality, it was a rationality that forced her to accept their general view. She was one of the very first to move in their direction. I cannot think of a better speaker to open the series of lecture in memory of Edna than Danny, a cherished friend and a tremendous source of inspiration. Edna majored in philosophy and mathematics. It was game theory that captivated her and indeed she mastered the language of game theory years before it became the lingua franca of the Center for the Study of Rationality. In her Oxford dissertation on norms, she already created a fusion between philosophy and game theory. 
The dissertation was published by Oxford University Press in 1977 under the title The Emergence of Norms. Norms enable agents to cooperate and coordinate their actions in situations their self-interest prevented. Here is Edna's celebrated parable. Two artillery men face the choice of fleeing from an advanced enemy or staying and using their gun. The gun is located in a strategically important pass. If both stay, they have a significant chance of being injured, but it is certain that the advance of the enemy will be halted. If both flee, the enemy will be able to take the mountain pass, overtake and capture them. If just one of them stays while the other flees, the brave artillerist will die in battle, but the other gunner will have just enough time to escape safely. Supposing that both try to survive this ordeal, preferably unhurt, each soldier has reason to flee. The reason for this is that they are engaged in a prisoner's dilemma. Both would be better off if both stood their ground. Being chained to their guns is one way of securing the better result. While the outcome of individual rational action is suboptimal or in the current lingua Pareto inefficient. Just as the mutual chaining commits the gunners to stay and fight, norms commit agents to avoid suboptimal outcomes. Norms bind individuals to their guns, as it were. On this view, the function of norms in general, and morality in particular, is to prevent the failures of rationality. Already in the book, she was greatly concerned with Thomas Hobbes' puzzle. How is it possible that people mired in distrust and suspicion succeed in bootstrapping themselves onto promise-keeping and trust? Her answer is truly ingenious. The state of mistrust, the state of nature in Hobbes' celebrated language can be rendered in two ways, as a prisoner's dilemma situation and as a Rousseau staghunt situation. Here is the staghunt situation. We are hunters. Separately, we can catch rabbits and eat badly. Together, we can catch stags and eat well. But if even one of us deserts the staghunt to catch a rabbit, the stag will get away. So the other stag hunters will not eat unless they desert to. Edna's point is that if people in state of mistrust, the state of nature, are not absolutely sure that they are in the prisoner's dilemma situation, moreover, they believe that there is even a slim probability that rather than being in a prisoner's dilemma situation, there is, they are in a stag hunt situation, then getting trust out of mistrust is a genuine logical possibility. The difference makes, that makes the difference is that the stag hunt cooperation, going after stag, is an equilibrium, while the prisoner's dilemma cooperation, keeping silent, is not an equilibrium, for each has an incentive to be a lone deviator. And that is what she proved. Edna was one of the first to bring game theory into philosophy. Knowing the young age of the, her death, it seems strange. But then Edna was only 26 years old when she submitted her dissertation to Oxford University. Her early work was done in lightning speed given that she already had served by then as an officer in our army. It was a speed that her spiritual mentor, the 26 years old David Hume of the Treaty on Human Nature, would have approved. In style and method, however, 
Edna was a keen spirit to Thomas Schelling, paying close attention to the phonology of strategic human interactions by bringing striking examples in the service of regimented account. It would be preposterous for me to try to give an account of Edna's contribution to the study of rationality, as the title I gave to my remarks suggests. Her contribution, I believe, amounts to a great deal, but then a great deal more should be said about it. All I can do in my limited time is to give you a glimpse of her work by referring to two typical papers of her, one on picking and one on opting, one on small decisions and one on big decisions. Newtonian physics is still a very good theory for all the middle-sized, middle-range things. It faces problems with the very small and the very big. Edna thought that normative decision theory, the one that tells us how we should act rationally rather than how we in fact act, is a very good theory for middle-sized decisions. It faces significant problems in dealing with small decisions and big decisions. Edna concentrated on the small and the big. Take for small, take for small size the decision told by the 11th century Al-Ghazali, arguably the most influential Muslim after Muhammad. In his version, a hungry man in front of whom are put two dates are equally distant, equally accessible, and completely alike in size, shape, and color, beauty and freshness, has to choose between the two. The man is allowed only one of the dates he cannot possibly choose, since by assumption there is nothing in respect of which one of them is preferable. Al-Ghazali's story was later told by the 14th century French priest Jean Bouridan about an ass placed between two equally distant piles of hay. This destined to starve for it has no reason to prefer one pile over the other. But then only an ass would starve for lack of reason to choose. Edna and Sidney Morgenbesser wrote a joint article describing the situation as a situation of picking rather than of choosing. Al Razali and Buridan conundrum looks contrived, yet it is as Edna and Sidney were prompt to claim the story of our modern life, with its assembly lines and homogenized products. Facing row of Campbell tomato soup cans when we want one is a situation of picking rather than of choosing. We extricate ourselves in such situation not by finding fatuous reasons for preferring one over the other, or say by tossing a coin after all, to decide which side of the coin stands for what is in itself just another situation of picking. Habit, such as reaching for the left can, may do the trick of picking. In picking a can of soup, we pick for a cause, such as being, le being left-handed, not for a reason. We know the type, the obsessive compulsive, the one who cannot help but turning every picking situation into choosing situation. Choosing for reason in such cases can be a sign of madness rather than a manifestation of rationality. But it may very well be the case that our most cherished projects and frames of reference, such as being Catholic or being a communist, are matters of picking. Once we, wa we are one or the other, we have many reasons to be one or the other. But we are usually thrown into our basic commitments rather than choosing them. Being thrown amounts to picking, not to choosing. Indeed, Edna's way of elucidating the existentialist idea of the absurd 
is by claiming that our most basic life's projects are at the bottom matters of picking rather than of choosing. If picking is Edna's way in dealing with small decisions, opting is her way in dealing with big decisions. Take the following for size. King Edward VIII making the agonizing decision, leaving the throne for the sake of the woman he loved. Ruth's choice for tying her fate with that of her mother-in-law, Naomi, who was returning from Moab to her native land and people in Bethlehem. Migration and marriage are typically clear examples of big decisions. What marks big decisions is that they are transformative to the person's life. The choice made in such, in such crossroads is likely to change one's beliefs desires, and even core values. You may be so utterly transformed by your decision that what counts for you as good reason to take the big decision might in, be in your new life a non-reason or even a bad reason. If a corporate executive turns into a Buddhist monk, his preferences are expected to go under radical change. The executive may turn into a monk as an act of conversion, like Paul on his way to Damascus, rather than on a big decision. The executive, in a way, is compelled to take the new road rather than choose it. Edna, Sharp deline Edna sharply delineates the difference among opting conversion as well as between opting and drifting. In drifting, one may be conscious of the choice but not how big it is. By incremental steps, the accumulation of which is big, we drift. Edna, in her short life of small and big decisions, not only advocated reasonableness, she incarnated it. Yet there was nothing grim, coy, or self-righteous in her conduct of life. It was happy and spontaneous, full of joy and zest. It is an exceptional case that one who advocates an ideal also exemplifies it. Edna was such an exceptional case. But then she was exceptional in so many other ways, for she had the precious ability of leading the charmed life of concentrated effort and divided attention. Let us be blessed with her memory.